Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mel Limus. I'm the co-founder of the Ontario Soil Network and I'll be moderating today's session on behalf of the Greenbelt Foundation. And uh, first thing I would like to start by acknowledging that across the Greenbelt, the land that we meet on and strive to protect is the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. The Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples have stewarded this land since time immemorial. Today, the region is also home to a diversity of other First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. And we are here for soil health. We're gonna talk about soil health, why it's important, how farmers can support soil health here and how you can support farmers to support healthy soils here. So it is about soil health. And this webinar is organized in part of the Power of Soil project. It's a collaboration between the Greenbelt Foundation and Equiterre from Quebec, as you can see here. It's generously, generously supported by the Metcalf Foundation, the Cliff Bar Foundation, and the Echo, Echo Foundation, just the Echo Foundation. Um, and the goal of this project is to advance soil health management in our respective provinces through federal policy. And in case you don't know what the green belt is, it is 2 million acres of protected land spanning, as you'll see here, the uh, Golden Horseshoe area up through the Niagara Escarpment and then across through the Oak Ridges Moraine, as you'll see. That provides clean air, fresh water, climate resilience, and local food. And it protects 750,000 acres of farmland which is some of the most productive soils in all of Canada. So the Greenbelt Foundation is a charitable organization dedicated to supporting and investing the health and prosperity of this Greenbelt. They work to ensure that it remains permanent, protected and prosperous. So before we get started, um, just a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is recorded and will be available on the Greenbelt Foundation's website. It'll be an hour if I do my job well. And we will begin with a presentation from Dr. David Montgomery for about half an hour with a big picture of history and soil. And it's followed by a local panel here uh, with Mark Eastman and Joanne Fettis. And we'll hear about uh, sustainable farming practices uh, right here in the Greenbelt. And we will address audience questions at the end. So please do ask questions as we go along. And I promise I will look um, in the Q&A box and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. David Montgomery, a MacArthur Fellow and a Professor of Geomorphology at the University of Washington. He's an internationally recognized geologist, author of many award-winning books, as you'll see here. And every time I hear from David, he has another book out, no word of a lie. <laughs> and, and, Today is no exception because we're, we're gonna get a sneak peek of his next book. And um, David, when I first saw you, it was when it was, you were just talking about dirt, the, your book, Dirt. And it really was um, a wake up call for a lot of people here in Ontario and across the world, and it still is. And it really spurred on this movement that you then later went on to write about. So I think it's just such a beautiful relationship. I just wanna thank you for the work that you did. And uh, to the rest of you, yeah, buckle in and enjoy. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> oh, well, uh, Mel, thank you uh, very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to, to talk to you all today. Uh, you know, when I, I wrote Dirt oh, back in 2007, and I'm a geologist by, by training, and I started looking into soils and eventually soil health, uh, really through the backwards looking lens of a geologist, trying to understand what had happened to the world's soils over the last 10,000 years in the agricultural era. And as I got more and more into it, I started to really realize that, you know, soil, there is such a thing as soil health and that it is very critically important, not only to natural ecosystems, but to agriculture and the future of human societies. Um, and I did not imagine when I wrote Dirt that I would be still writing books about the soil 10, 15 years later um, and enjoying it and learning a lot as I go and learning from a lot of farmers and a lot of other academics and, and activists. There's a lot of people concerned about the state of the world's soils today, uh, and it's a it's a good thing that people are becoming sort of aware of and um, 
uh, of the issues and problems. Uh, these the three dirt, uh, books that are on the screen that you know dirt tells the history of of uh, the way soils have been treated back through past civilizations the hidden half of nature is the book i wrote with my wife Anne clay who i'll introduce her ideas in a little bit um but it's it's looks at how microbial life the biology in the soil was the part that we kind of forgot about in the 20th century in terms of agriculture and how it's critically important um, for the health of not only plants and crops, but you know what that life does inside of us as well in terms of microbial life, uh, the, our micro, microbiomes. And plants have a microbiome too. It's as important for them as ours is for us. And Growing a Revolution looks at how to take the history in that first book, the science in the second book, and how farmers around the world are applying it uh, for regenerating and rebuilding healthy fertile soils in different in, uh, different in their different settings all around the world. So I've gone from being something of a pessimist about the soil degradation problem when I first started looking into it uh, some de couple decades ago, um, and I've become much more of an optimist because I see a way through it, I see a path through. But so let me start with the depressing backwards looking part because if we look back at the history of societies around the world, soil erosion and degradation really played a role in the demise of ancient civilizations. And you can trace that back to Bronze Age Europe, Classical Greece, Rome, the Southern United States, Central America, and more, all the places that I talked about in the Dirt Book. There's a, a, basically a pattern that one can uh, detect by looking back through history, and, and you can see it written in the land in the state of soils in different areas around the world, that traces back to an unusual uh, villain. If a, if a nonfiction book can have a villain, the villain of the Dirt Book is the plow. And because it was the tillage, the act of plowing that really uh, over the, if sustained over the long run, fundamentally degraded soil fertility in region after region around the world. And why is that? I mean, we tend to think of tillage as sort of an iconic uh, act that farmers uh, engage in to prepare the fields for planting. And it has value agronomically, or it wouldn't have been used for so long in so many places, but it has a downside. And that downside is that the plow fundamentally alters the balance between soil production and soil erosion on the lands that we depend on for our food. And that, that, that it increases erosion to the po point where it can outpace nature's ability to rebuild, rebuild and replace the soil that has been lost. And that's really the story uh, that I told in Dirt of society, society, society after society around the world. And how does that work? Well, think what tillage does to the land. It leaves the surface of the soil bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain, like this field in eastern Washington of my home state down here south of the border. Um, this is an, a winter wheat field and in the eastern Washington, and it illustrates very well why a geologist like myself would look at, at tillage as a slow motion environmental catastrophe. Because what happens if it rains on a freshly plowed field? Well, you get all those little channels that are cut into the landscape here. Uh, things that I would call a rill technically, but that you could plow over with a single pass of a plow, you can erase them, but they represent the down, downhill movement of soil uh, slowly and sometimes not so slowly uh, in a, at a pace that nature just does, can't keep up with. Uh, and so how big a deal is that? Um, that this is, of course, it's a winter wheat field in the fallow part of the traditional um, wheat fallow rotation. Uh, it's a, a bit of an extreme example, as is this one, but it has lessons in it. What this slide shows you is, is another winter wheat field in eastern Washington in the Palouse region. It has beautiful agricultural soils. If you just add water, they can grow incredible um, uh, harvests. But that fence in the upper right-hand corner was the fence that a farmer put in in 1911 when the land surface was up here. And by 1961, the land was down to the, the on the this field that was just plowed and planted in winter wheat and left fallow in between for 50 years. Uh, this cliff developed around that fence line. Uh, and this little black line right here is a one foot increment on a survey rod. That's a five foot cliff that developed in 50 years with nothing happening on this field other than sort of regular tillage and then erosion by those rills and tillage pushes soil down slope bit by bit as well. Uh, five feet of soil loss in 50 years is about a foot a decade that translates to roughly an inch a year. There's nowhere on earth that soils are built naturally at that pace. The, the fastest known pace of soil building uh, that, we've, that we've measured scientifically is on the order of that, on that steep slope in the South Island of New Zealand, that's absolutely falling apart. The rocks are just disintegrating before your eyes. Nature can't keep up with this pace of soil loss and that can have a big effect. 
Uh, and that's the story I told in Dirt, but there, there's another aspect to soil degradation that is just as important as the loss of the soil itself, and that's the loss of soil organic matter. It's the loss of carbon from the soil. Um, and this paper from uh, 2015 in the journal Sustainability summed it up fairly well in, in um, a documenting that the soil organic matter content of many soils in North America is only about half of the level that they were at the time those lands were first converted from forests or prairies into farmlands. In other words, we've done a pretty good job here, not just here in North America, but actually really around the world at converting soils that started out looking like this, nice forest soil into soils that look like this. Um, and what this example is, is two soils from adjacent fields in North Carolina. The one on the right, the khaki one that kind of looks like California beach sand crusted over with salt uh, is one that was conventionally managed with you know, intensive tillage and, and, um, and nitrogen-based fertilizers for the last 100, 150 years. Um, the one on the left is a field that was from that was uh, abandoned to farming about 100, 100 to 150 years ago. And the forest regrew, there's about three quarter of a meter diameter trees on the land now. Nature can rebuild soil organic matter over time. Uh, and what I like about this slide is it illustrates that it doesn't take long, just a century of farming to convert organic matter rich soil into degraded soil, and, but it can be reversed. But nature tends to do it slowly. Uh, and that combination of soil, um, of the loss of soil organic matter and the loss of the soil itself has proved um, instrumental in degrading agricultural lands around the world. So one of the things I did in writing dirt was to actually try and assess how fast is that happening. So I went to the library for roughly a month and gathered all the data I could find at that point back in 2007 on how fast are the world's farms eroding and how fast does nature build soils. What I came up with was kind of disturbing. Uh, at, in the modern era, soils are eroding about a millimeter and a half per year as a global average in terms of soil loss from conventional farmlands. That means that it takes only about two decades, 20 years to erode an inch of fertile topsoil. How fast does nature replace that? Well, at about 2% of a millimeter a year. And at that pace, it would take you know, centuries to, to push in a millennium, push in a thousand years to rebuild that inch of soil that modern farming is shedding in a couple decades. Therein lies the problem with global soil erosion and soil loss. And to me, that's the most compelling argument there is for the need to rebuild soil fertility and rethink the way we've been uh, farming conventionally to figure out how we can do it without that magnitude of soil loss. And this slide is actually the final one of the depressing part of the talk. I'm gonna get optimistic in a minute because I think we can actually solve this problem. Um, but let me run you through a simple thought experiment that you can sort of run on the back of a napkin if you like those kind of simple calculations. Uh, where I, what I've just shown you is the data that you could use to actually predict how long should an agricultural civilization last on average. Because that net soil loss of about a millimeter a year implies that you could erode a typical half meter to one meter thick hill slope topsoil in roughly 500 to 1,000 years. That it could take you know, a few centuries to you know, push in maybe 1,000 years to burn through the, a, a, a natural landscape's endowment of fertile soil. It turns out that that's approximately the lifespan of most major agricultural civilizations around the world with a couple key exceptions. Because I hope you're sitting there thinking, well, what about the Tigris and the Euphrates in, in the Middle East? What about the Nile in Egypt or the Indus and the Brahmaputra in India or the, or the big rivers, valleys of lowland China? Those are all places people have farmed for thousands of years, which you know is a pretty good definition of sustainable farming. The problem is those are very specific geographies. Those are big river floodplains. And what happens on river floodplains? Well, they flood, it's right there in the name. And what happens with, uh, when the waters arrive? They also bring silt and sand and clay. They can replenish the soil, the topsoil that's lost from, from tillage erosion. Uh, and, and on relatively flat land on floodplains, uh, it's, there's not a lot of erosive energy to, to, get, to work with. Where the problem happens is when conventional farming or tillage-based farming spreads out of floodplains onto hillside soils, the clock literally starts ticking on the lifespan of civilizations. So this, of course, motivates the question of, is soil restoration possible? Can we actually reverse that historical pattern, or are we doomed to repeat the, you know, the story of ancient civilizations? This is where I started to get a little optimistic, and, and that optimism really came from a, an unusual source. It came from my own yard, a place that most geologists don't tend to do field work. 
but I, I'm blessed with a with um, having married a uh, biologist who is a extraordinary gardener and a extraordinary writer, and we wrote the hidden half of nature together to basically describe our experience at converting the soil of our house in North Seattle, where we, that we bought you know, back in the late '90s, that into the garden that that Anne has today, and. This is the soil that we had when we when we peeled the lawn that our house came with it came with what I call an old growth Seattle lawn six inches of tangled roots that had never been planted by anybody the Norwegian couple we bought it from that had lived in there for, for forever were not gardeners. Um, they had basically a lawn that when you peeled it off it had you know notice the color it's like that khaki beach sand from the North Carolina farm field that I showed you there was no organic matter. It was less than 1%. There wasn't a single worm that we found beneath that lawn when we peeled it off. Uh, so Anne, the biologist, decided that, you know, we had the mineral part. We had the geological part. We had my part of healthy soil. What we didn't have is the biology. So she decided to go on what we called her organic matter crusade, which was uh, adding wood chips like you see around her wheelbarrow there that she got painted up with a little help from a local auto body shop. Um, and... <laughs> And it really does go faster when you paint it up that way. Um, but she would bring uh, uh, composted uh, uh, coffee grounds from the coffee shops in Seattle, composted herbivore manure from the Seattle Zoo. There's lots of organic matter sources in the city if you look for them. And she went on a long-term effort to try and reintroduce organic matter to her soil. And what she was able to do over the course of about 10 years is convert the original soil we started with, which again, looks like that North Carolina to, um, uh, field that was degraded. And we convert it into the soil that we have today, rich black earth. It's the same yard, the same soil, the same starting point. The only difference is how we treated the land for roughly 10 years. And we took something that had about 1% organic matter and built it up to push in 10%. Uh, and it turns out we weren't the ones doing most of the work. Most of the work was actually being done by the organisms in the soil, the soil life that took the compost that Anne was carefully lay layering on the soil and not digging it in. We were basically just layering it on and letting the biology take that organic matter down into the soil and recycle it. And the bacteria and the fungi in the soil and the microarthropods and the nematodes that eat the bacteria and the fungi and their waste products, uh, are essentially are what gets translated into soil organic matter, soil carbon. It's the fuel that drives the food web, the soil food web, which turns out to drive a lot of nutrient cycling in the soil. We all I'm sure have been taught that you know, trees capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, merge it with water through the magic of photosynthesis to build their green bodies, they give off oxygen, which we're thankful for. Um, but they also do something that's very interesting that, that Ann and I were not exposed to until after graduate school uh, soil science classes, that plants are pushing exudates out of their roots that are um, compounds such as carbohydrates, uh, fats, proteins, uh, even hormones they're pushing out of their roots into the soil. And at first that sounds pretty darn inefficient. Why would they go through all the effort of photosynthesis to capture solar energy and then just push it out into the, into the zone around their roots, a zone that's known as the rhizosphere, which is literally Greek for zone around the roots. Um, well, why would plants do that? Well, they're not doing it because they're inefficient. Nature is brutally efficient in terms of evolution. Um, they're doing it because they gain a benefit from it. They're doing it because that, you know, those carbohydrates, those fats, those proteins, what does that sound like? It sounds a lot like a meal. It sounds like food. They're basically dripping food out of their roots to attract particular organisms in the soil that uh, live in what Ann and I termed the biological bazaar around the roots of plants. And so if you blow up the root around, uh, around the area around a root tip, that rhizosphere extends about a millimeter to a centimeter. It's about the thickness of my thumbnail to the length of my thumbnail around the, every root of a plant. And it's filled with life. Why? Because those exudates get consumed right after they leave the roots. They don't make it very far. Those plants are recruiting particular species of bacteria and fungi to live around the roots because they do things that help the plant. So when those exudates come out of a plant root and an organism uh, consumes it, those organisms produce metabolites. So microbes that consume things have their own waste products. We politely call them metabolites, but what are they? Well, what blew Anne and, I, man, Anne and my mind when we found a study that um, was describing how uh, microbial and bacterial metabolites in the soil that were produced from microbes consuming exudates uh, included things like plant growth promoting hormones. So the plants are dripping out essentially sugar into the root zone. The microbes are converting it into hormones that help the plant grow to get bigger 
enlarge its solar collectors to produce more sugar to feed more microbes. That's a positive reinforcement. It's a virtuous circle. Um, it's a symbiotic relationship. And fungi in the soil have many symbiotic relationships with, with plant life as well, uh, as particularly in terms of acquiring and bringing mineral nutrients to plants, phosphorus in particular, of which might be of interest to farmers, but also zinc, which is of critical interest to consumers and eaters. Uh, and what does that do? It serves as a root extension for the plants. And the fungi can't photosynthesize. They are dependent to some degree on the, the exudates that the plants produce and they pay for it in effect with mineral elements that help the plants grow and remain healthy. And those mineral elements are central to plant defense and health. And plants will also, in partnership with their root microbiome and, and on their own at times, produce phytochemicals that uh, can do things like help repel insect herbivores, insect pests. Uh, and there's another study that we ran across in researching this, uh, the hidden half of nature that documented how plants that put out exudates in the soil can re recruit particular microbes that produce particular compounds that uh, repel particular insect pests. So when a plant starts getting nibbled on, they send a signal out to their allies in the soil that essentially um, do a little uh, uh, offshore agrochemical production for them. The plants then pull it back in through their roots and everybody in that symbiotic relationship is happy. So the, the kind of that writing that book opened our eyes to thinking about the, na the nature of the relationship between plants and soil life and how crucial soil life was for the natural health plan that plants evolved with. It's their defense system. Think about what a plant can do. It, it, it can't run away from an herbivore. It has to rely on a chemical, ar a chemical arsenal and microbes in the soil are the partners that they've developed you know, um, highly adapted evolutionary relationships, uh, just like we know of above ground between pollinators and flowers, similar kind of things are happening between bacteria, fungi, and roots in the soil, but we don't know about them because they're out of sight and out of mind in the hidden half of nature. So, uh, you know, it's one thing to restore life to the soil in an urban lot uh, in Seattle. It's a whole nother thing to do it on an operational, economically viable farm. So as we were writing The Hidden Half of Nature, I decided to basically take a little time off from my academic job and visit farms around the world where farmers had done to their farms what Anne had done to our yard. And I should be clear, Anne is the mastermind at restoring our soil. She's the biologist. She's the genius behind that. Um, I, I sort of observed and helped write about it. Um, but I did have the question of, you know, could you do it on a real farm? So I, I went and visited farms around the world uh, in equatorial Africa, Central America, and across North America in both the United States and Canada. And the farmers that I visited are, were farmers selected to be farmers who had been very successful at rebuilding soil health and soil fertility. What I found is that they shared some common characteristics. They all followed the principles of conservation agriculture, which involved minimal or no disturbance of the soil itself. So it's some form of no-till farming. Uh, maintaining a permanent ground cover on their fields. So it was nothing like that field I showed you from the Palouse where it was a bare field after tillage. They always kept a living plant growing in the ground and that translates practically into cover crops. Uh, and they also drew, grew diverse rotations of crops. Um, they weren't just growing corn and soybeans, they were growing a great variety of plants. Uh, and crops. And why are all those little microbes on the screen here? This is to remind me to say that this recipe of three things, no minimal disturbance, keeping the ground covered and a diverse crop rotation is a recipe for cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. And it also happens to be just about 180 degrees from what we've taught people in agronomy for the last hundred years. It's a different way of thinking about the soil and thinking about taking care of the soil and the land. But there's also, it's important to note that those general principles Translate to, different, translate to different settings around the world, but the specific practices don't. They need to be tailored to the specific area, to the crops people are growing, to the technology they have access to, to the climate that they're trying to grow crops in. Uh, so a big challenge of a regenerative style of agriculture that can rebuild soil fertility, uh, that can basically turn soil like this khaki clay soil in Ohio into this rich black soil. It's the same parent soil, the difference is the farmer for 20 years adopted those all those three regenerative practices. Um, the big difference there is how people really treat the land. Um, but the practices are different in Ohio than they would be in, let's say, a place like North Dakota, which is another example of a regenerative farmer who has uh, taken soil that looked about like this, which is actually pretty decent soil and turned it into super decent, incredible, amazing soil. 
Um, and this farmer, Gabe Brown from Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, was also adding uh, livestock, reintegrating animal husbandry into his operation in ways that accelerated the building of soil organic matter. Um, so interviewing these farmers around the world is a real eye opener for me in terms of both the power of these general principles of conservation agriculture and the potential for reintegrating animal husbandry into a regenerative style of farming that could improve the health and fertility of the lands that we depend on to grow our food. Um, those are both sort of counter conventional narrative, um, but I'm a firm believer in believing things I can see uh, with my eyes and that have been done. And, you know, about the fifth farm I visited where someone had turned khaki ish color uh, soil into rich black earth and they all followed sort of a similar philosophical framework, I started to think, you know, there's really something serious here and something seriously good. And it's also something that can benefit farmers because what I've also found is that. Um, uh, the farmers who had adopted re these regenerative practices based on those principles were actually faring out better economically than their more conventional neighbors. And you don't have to just take my word for it in the hidden in growing a revolution, but uh, Claire Lacan and Jonathan Lundgren, uh, two researchers at South Dakota State University, uh, ran a study in the American Midwest looking at, I think it was about 20 paired conventional and regenerative farms that were mostly growing corn in this, in this example. And what I'm showing here is a figure from their paper that shows the net revenue and costs on average for their conventional farms and their regenerative farms. So it's sort of dollars per acre, you, the total, uh, their uh, their revenue is the top end of the bar. What they spent is all the different colored things for all these different inputs. What's left over is the white bits, which is the profit. And the two salient things you'll notice is that the regenerative farms on average harvested more and made more money, spent less to do it, and therefore had a higher profit. That's really when I started to turn into an optimist and thinking that these kind of ideas might catch on in the kind of time frame that could really help us in the course of the 21st century. I know it's going to take a while to convert conventional agriculture to a more regenerative framework. But if it can be done in a few, if it can be done profitably today, it's going to accelerate the pace at which it's happening. And I've seen great movement on, on from farmers themselves, sort of pushing the idea of building healthy soil as a key towards the future of farming. What are the benefits of healthy soils? Uh, higher farmer profits, comparable yields. It's not a question of feeding the world versus going sustainable. I think they're perfectly compatible. Um, and we can use less fertilizer, less pesticide and fossil fuels to grow the food that we need. And we can simultaneously increase the amount of carbon in the soil. That's carbon that's taken from the atmosphere via photosynthesis and parked in the soil, not parked permanently, but cycled and increasing the reservoir capacity of the soil, which does take it out of circulation in the atmosphere. And there's a huge potential to help with climate mitigation uh, in that regard. But also if you're using less uh, fertilizer, you're resulting in less offsite, less offsite pollution. And there's a biodiversity benefit as well from using less pesticide and restoring life in the soil. So there's lots of benefits for a healthy fertile soil, but there's one thing I haven't mentioned yet, and that's actually the subject of the new book that Anne and I have literally just finished. Um, and that is a question about what does regeneratively grown food in healthy fertile soil mean for the quality of, of our lives, for our health, for the health of consumers, for the food that we eat. And so What Your Food Ate is the book that we've just finished that will be out uh, this coming spring. I think it's uh, out and available now for pre-order, but we're literally in the page proof stage. It's a long, slow process. Uh, and what we did is we looked into both in the literature and also ran some tests on paired farms of regenerative conve and conventional farms where we compared the food that came off of them. Uh, and I'll just show you, I'll tease you with just sort of a couple examples from it before we get to the discussion. But this is an example of where we had two adjacent fields that were, that were growing wheat that were direct seeded, so both no-till fields, but one was treated with cover crops and the other was, uh, and cover crops and a more diverse rotation. And the other one uh, had a simplified rotation and, um, and, uh, and used glyphosate for weed control. So sort of conventional versus regenerative practices. This lists all the mineral elements that we tested. The ones in green are the ones where the, the cover cropped one field had more than the conventional field. And you'll notice, I wanna call your attention particularly here to zinc down here, that 56% more zinc in the second year of this, of, this, um, of this example. We didn't measure anything in the first year because actually the farm was running the experiment. When we got there, it was on the second year. You can't increase the zinc content of the soil by 56% in two years. What you can do is you can change the biology of the soil in a way that accesses the zinc that's already there and gets it into the crops. 
Uh, and you notice the things in red, the ones that the conventional uh, field had more of, it's sodium, nickel, cadmium. Those are not the things you want in your food. So there's a clear influence, I think, in terms of how uh, regenerative and conventional uh, practices stack up in relation to mineral density. Uh, you know, it's complicated in terms of mineral density. There's all kind of, the geology, the soil obviously matters a lot too. The point here being is that it's possible to actually change the abundance of them fairly rapidly. And we also did a test across the, the continental US involving 10 paired farm studies of regenerative and conventional farms, literally across the fence row, side by side comparisons where we looked at soil organic matter. So then the graph down here at the bottom left, you've got the regenerative fields that had anywhere from about three to 12 to 11 some odd percent soil organic matter with an average pushing about six. The conventional fields, literally the farms next door had more like about 3% soil organic matter with a much more compressed range. Uh, in other words, soil organic matter on the regenerative farms that have been farming regeneratively for between five to 10 years, so a little less than a decade, they had virtually doubled the amount of soil organic matter across the board. In terms of soil health scores, there's a soil health metric called the Haney test that we report the values here, the regenerative ones are two to three times higher than the conventional ones. These regenerative practices can build topsoil organic matter. There's still controversy about this full soil profile, but for the farms that we measured, at least in the upper, in the upper part, the part that is actually intimately involved in nutrient cycling in the soil, there's a big effect of the regenerative practices on soil organic matter. And what we also found is that the, the crops that were harvested off those regenerative farms had 15 to 20% more phenolics, phytosterols, and carotenoids, phytochemicals that have demonstrated importance for human health in our diet. And it can also increase the vitamin and mineral content of particular micronutrients, as I showed, particularly zinc and wheat, which is a big inter global um, problem in terms of zinc deficiency. So basically what I wanna leave you with is that I've been on this sort of 10 year journey uh, going from thinking about the soil the way a geologist does to now being convinced that the way that we treat our farm fields impacts the quality of the food that we get and the, the, its, its potential for supporting human health, particularly in terms of chronic conditions in ways that reflect the health of the land and the health of the soil. So the key message in what your food ate basically is, you know, what's good for the land is good for us too. And I'm not sure that should really be all that much of a surprising realization, but there's a solid thread of science that you can connect going through, you know, from how ancient civilizations fared to what you can find in supermarkets today that really bolsters that argument that what's good for the land is good for us as well. Uh, so I'll leave you there um, and look forward to engaging in, in more discussions as we, uh, as we continue this. Thank you so much, David. <laughs> I did warn everyone to uh, fasten their belts or hold on to their hats. That was a whirlwind of, uh, through all of those books. And definitely, I would recommend everyone just grab those books and you can do a much more slow <laughs> ride through, through the arguments because they're definitely based in a lot of science and a lot of hope. I yeah. really love that. Yeah, we do. We, uh, you know, at the back of each of those books, there's like 30 to 50 pages of citations. And yeah. you know, I've actually read all those things, so you don't have to. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> all of us, thank you. Um, there, there are a few questions coming in, but I am going to keep them to the end because, uh, well, one of the first questions from, from Joan is, are there Canadian examples? And for sure, that's what we're going to talk about um, right now. Um, just, just a few stats uh, for the green belt alone. In the last 20 years, um, the percent there's 25% more acres are not tilled, um, which is good. 50% uh, more farmers using cover crops and uh, double the farmers using windbreaks. And windbreaks are great for uh, stopping wind erosion and uh, all the other benefits of trees as well. So, so there's lots of good news happening right here in the green belt. And now we're gonna hear from a farmer in the green belt. Um, we've got Joanne Fettis here. Um, Joanne, there you are. We're, oh, this is where Joanne lives. Can you believe it? So this is uh, La Primavera Farms uh, and Joanne is a third generation farmer there. And it's a diverse farm with poultry, corn, soybeans, wheat, cut flowers, and a small herd of Highland cattle. Um, and let's tell me more about your farm, Joanne, and uh, and then what is it that you're doing to improve the soil? 
Thanks, Mel. Um, yeah, it's uh, wonderful to be in this panel. We're talking about Greenbelt, where we live. And there's a lot of things that we're doing on our farm that are all, I don't know, you can call them innovative, but they're just experiments, basically. We're trying to make sure that our ground stays green as long as it can. We're covering as much of the field crops with cover crops as soon as they come off. Um, I've been rotating my small herd of highlands in the fall out on tillage radish, whatever cover crops we decide to experiment with, a bit of corn stubble. Um, the turkeys are close to home because too many things want to eat them. So they're not, they're only pastured <laughs> on about a half an acre. And then um, we implement whatever we can, we get whatever we can utilize with tools that we have. And then we learn from our neighbors and from the soil network about what people are doing locally as well and what other, what other tools we can incorporate into our, our techniques. And how long have you been doing this? Uh, like, did your dad do this? And, and uh, Ant, have you seen any impacts and changes in the soil? There's a great question. So growing up, the big thing was you plowed and you did all the field work along the perimeter of your property first so that everyone you knew that everyone knew that you were busy. Um, yeah, there's that's so many, yes. it's, it feels like sometimes people are always sort of watching. It's just the farmers, I'm sure, that care, but they wanted to make sure that you were doing field work. But then it slowly transitioned into maybe the early 2000s into being recognizing the soil kind of blowing across the, the neighborhood into snowdrifts and then starting to just start with rye. So simple cover crops, it's affordable. You can drill it in right after you take off corn, soybean, wheat, after anything really. And then it just holds it together. And then you do soil sampling more regularly. And then you find, you dig a big hole and you see all the worms and you see that you're in the winter, that huge green field is not blowing all the beautiful topsoil across the road. So uh, I definitely grew up plowing, disking, and then cultivating to make that beautiful seed bread. And then I'm sure that we lost our two mills every every winter and then from, being, from 16 year olds old to 20 years old just being like there's got to be a better way to do this and then start chisel like in barrow tilling or chisel plowing and then switching to as much no-till as we can um, we do have to incorporate some minimum till with this fancy fast disc there that we have a cover crop spreader on top of so when I cut down all my cut flower fields there's about 40 acres of that stocks are two meters tall and we have to take them down and work them in so that they break down so we can work the soil again the next year but they're immediately covered with rye or oats or clover and so that by the time it's spring it's still green mm -hmm. green so. yeah so gorgeous but so what is it like what's really driving that what was that why behind all those changes that you've been making a lot of it was you can you can visibly see soil erosion, right? It's like every year when you're plowing a certain direction, you see that that gully and that gully gets bigger and then it spreads as it's going and you just sort of, it hurts your, it hurts your heart a little bit. You just watch all that soil flowing away. So then you plant around it and then you stop working certain areas. We planted windrows with the conservation of Hamilton has given uh, a lot of trees to certain pro cost pro government projects that we can put up windbreaks. Um, a lot of it is just believing that there's a better way to build soil. We want it to be black and beautiful and full of like, full of happy things that are living in there that we can't see. And the best way to do that is by building it back up. Yeah. Uh, this warms my heart for sure. But the, the big question probably a lot of people are wondering is like, why aren't all farmers doing this? If it's such a great idea, like... Uh, if, if there's so many reasons why it's equipment is crazy expensive, you mm -hmm. um, past, pasturing your, your herd of cattle takes a lot of extra work versus having them in a, a barnyard. Um, a lot of it is management practices. So you can pick a few that work best for your farm. And then for us, it was, we live in the most beautiful, like Carolinian forest, Greenbelt, Niagara Escarpment. Like we're covering a lot of beautiful territory here. And um, I wanted to take the soil that, I was working with and make it so much better so that it, there was no question of, am I leaving it in a better shape for my kids? Because I am, or whoever decides to farm this next. Yeah. Um, and then I think the biggest challenge would be, yeah, cost of equipment, uh, the matter that's left on the soil. So you have, say you grow two meters full of rye and you didn't get, you didn't burn it down on time and you have to bail it off your property because you can't plant into it. So 
a crimper is thirty thousand dollars, and that would be like a, a, a machine that would break the stalks of the rye so you can lay it down and then plant into it. And I, you know, we want one, but it's it's on the list. So now we do uh, we do alternative things. So it might be rolling it, it might be just drilling it into like planting into it when it's short enough. I bale a bunch of the cover crops and I make baleage out of them for my cows. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just the, we also wanna see the benefits of it. So now there's more and more science and more and more, there's journals, there's publish, publishing, publishings. People have published papers about the benefits of it and the cost benefits. So 10 years ago, there was no real proof that co cover crops would say, would make you money. Whereas now there is, so people can look up talk to a mafra, they can talk to other farmers and they can see that they're spending less time on in their tractor on the field, less fuel, less fertilizer. Fertilizer inputs are less because they're not running off, you're holding onto them and capturing them in your crop. Um, but it really takes seeing it all around you and then trying it and then seeing that it works and then trying it on a bigger scale and then it, it keeps going. So I know that there are a lot of farmers in Southern Ontario trying this and all the way to Ottawa and north as well and a lot of it is just it doesn't make sense to be working your land like the the cost efficiency is is not it doesn't it doesn't add up so there are ways we can improve it but it, it sounds like it really is like it's happening and it i and that really yeah and that really was like it is a revolution it is a movement and we're in the middle of it right now and then it's yeah. um and really us here too, my family farms. And it's like, when you know better, you do better. And for many years, and really, uh, like your first book, David really was like, holy crap, you can't, you can't see it. There's so many times you can't see it, but like now, now that we know, and now that we're learning that actually we can improve the profitability soil health, and it is really hopeful. I'm really hopeful for, for the, every year, there's more and more farmers doing this. So Thank you, Joanne. I want to uh, bring up Mark Eastman as well. And Mark is um, the Agriculture Outreach uh, Coordinator at Credit Valley Conservation, but he also farms in the Halton region. And Mark, um, yeah, you've had a lot of farm experience, but I want to hear from you from the Conservation Authority perspective. Um, why is soil health important from a watershed perspective? Yeah, it's um, it's really quite imperative, actually. Um, you know, when we have less than ideal soil conditions, the the it's not always obvious on the landscape immediately, but it tends to show itself quite quickly in our rivers and lakes, our water bodies. Um, that excess soil uh, coming from farmlands can impair fish habitat, literally by physically covering uh, the spawning beds the fish need for reproduction. Oftentimes, there can be nutrients associated with this sediment loss as well. Um, and when it makes its way into the rivers and lakes, uh, it can cause um, the vegetation within those, those um, features to really uh, grow vigorously. And at the end of their life cycle, uh, when, they, when they die back, the microbes in the water take a hold. And um, they do what they do. They decompose that, that living material, consuming oxygen from the water, and if it drops to a point where it hits a certain level, that's when we can start to see those fish, fish kills occurring within the, those water courses as well. No, but it's not all about the fish. Um, when soils are unhealthy, <laughs> <laughs> watershed yeah. residents can be directly impacted in a couple of different ways as well. Um, firstly, impaired soils, they, they do not infiltrate or absorb that water as quickly as a healthy soil might. Uh, Dr. Montgomery spoke of this in his presentation. So what this means is that um, a greater percentage of that rainfall that hits the soil surface tends to run off the surface instead of infiltrating deeper into the profile. And this quick flash of water from land to water um, is often what causes our flooding in our, our built up environments. And there's a, you know, there's a saying, flooding is really only a problem because we exist in that location. It's a natural process. <laughs> but, when, but when we build and develop within these areas, um, that's totally. when it becomes more of a problem for us. And, and it, can, it can be a massive inconvenience and a massive expense as well. Um, but the other side of it is that, especially in our rural portion of our watershed in particular, it's, it's groundwater fed, meaning most people get their drinking water from groundwater system. And when we're not effectively infiltrating water uh, to a maximum potential across that, that watershed, um, that's lost opportunity for drinking water supply. 
Um, so uh, we want to slow it down and get it in uh, the ground as much as possible. And, uh, you know, agricultural lands, depending on management, can infiltrate a lot of water or um, can underperform in that regard. And it all starts with, with management. Um, the last one I really want to quickly touch on is is how um, soil is linked to, to air quality as well. And Dr. Montgomery touched on this as well uh, with those root exudates being um, so important to feeding the biological community. And I think my takeaway from hearing Dr. Montgomery speak on that is, you know, we don't have to do it at all. Soils are resilient and there are other things active within that soil that help us build healthy soils. As land managers and practitioners, we just have to set the conditions right and, and be there to sort of shepherd it along and then let the system take hold and really, really go, go wild in building a, a real quality soil. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're doing a lot of work with farmers. What is it, um, what is it that you're working with farmers on? Yeah. Um, I'll maybe just start quickly with a, a bit more background of the, the context in which I work. Um, so I'm with Credit Valley Conservation and you know, we're in the, the greater Toronto area and I, I imagine some of our, our viewers here tonight are coming in from outside the area, um, but we're not really thought about as a, a super agriculturally intensive area. We have one of the most rapidly growing urban centers um, uh, and, and form part of the, the GTA. Uh, but we still do have roughly 30% of our watershed area in agricultural production. And so uh, farmers are, are obviously managing that land as well as the woodlands and wetlands associated with those properties. And so you know, for uh, what is not considered a, a real intensive agricultural zone, it is you know, making up a third to a half of our, of our land base. So farmers really are seen as a, a key uh, demographic for us to be working with if we really want to see some changes on, on, the, on the ground. Um, but to really answer your question, Mel, uh, my work is really focused <laughs> on reaching out to, uh, to farmers and supporting them with um, programs and services that help improve their awareness and understanding of local environmental challenges and how they can be part of that solution to address. Uh, so get it, yet again, um, we hold a lot of workshops, farm tours, conduct site visits and develop and deliver incentive programs. These can be financial or technical in nature. Um, and they are all geared towards helping farmers take that action to improve the environment for all of our, our watershed residents. Um, particularly relevant to tonight's webinar is the work we're doing uh, on soil health, uh, which is actually a relatively new program area for us. We haven't, we've always kind of worked in it, but it's never been so specific. Um, it's always been around the fringe or benefits to soil health have always been um, sort of seen as the like the secondary benefit. And now we're getting a bit more deliberate in our programming, as are many other conservation authorities across the province and, and other organizations. So we've been spending a bit more time working one on one with farmers um, to better understand the current status, do some benchmarking with them on their soils. Um, across the lands that they manage. So in our, our program, we conduct a series of simple observation-based tests that allow us to assess overall soil health. We are testing for things like earthworm presence and abundance, water infiltration, digging soil pits, just to simply determine depth of topsoil, which I think is probably something every farmer or land manager, everyone should be out there doing. Um, and just, just performing those visual assessments of how the soil looks in your hand when you, when you dig it out of the soil. It sounds super simple, but I actually think it's, it is what's necessary to getting us past a, a bit of a, a hump where we, um, the, the, the masses are super curious in soil health and soils in general. And with a quick look and a feel of that soil, they can see a, a level of impairment or, or quality and, and start to think about and be curious about the management practices that will set it on that new trajectory towards improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, what, it's, it's what, interesting. And you're seeing a lot of impacts, like any success stories? Yeah, I can, um, I can share with you uh, one grower that we've worked uh, a lot with over uh, the last number of years, about eight years or so. And over that time, you know, we've had uh, a lot of walks and talks across their land. Um, I, I find one on one and, and spending time on their land and hearing from them um, so rewarding in the work that I do. I, I you know, I, I'm no expert. I learn 
from them as much as I hope I pass on tidbits of experience that really I'm just gleaning from other farmers, assimilating and passing on and uh, really see myself in, in providing that service. Um, but over that eight years, you know, we've done windbreak planting, streamside plantings. We've helped diversify the crop rotation. We've got winter wheat back into that rotation. We've got um, cover crops always after uh, wheat now. And we're pretty interested in trying um, integration of cover crops into standing corn. Um, not quite there, but getting close. And um, we've got them um, reducing depth and frequency of tillage. We've done some grid sampling as well, and really trying to get super efficient with placement of those inputs uh, on the farm. You know, with with all that said, though, um, there still were a few trouble areas on the farm. We did have some gully erosion uh, happening in a few spots, and uh, with the help of one of our incentive programs, we designed and implemented. Um, a series of, of water and sediment control basins for the farm, essentially berms in that field to slow that water down and infiltrate as much as possible, drop out the sediment, drop out the nutrients before discharging it uh, downstream. But it's really, it's really that relationship piece I, I like, Mel, in, uh, in mm -hmm. the work that I, that I do and, and take a lot of enjoyment in. Yeah, I love working with farmers. Thanks, Mark. Um, and Joanne and, uh, and David, we have only a few minutes left now. That flew by. Um, uh, please enter your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I do have a few lined up here, but um, David wondered if you wanted to do any reflection on uh, what jo Joanne and Mark uh, just alluded to. Well, um, it's great to hear uh, that the, these kind of practices and ideas are catching on. Um, and the people are learning how to adapt them to, to, to the green belt in your corner of the world. And I've seen sort of very similar things happen in, in pretty much every place that I've looked into in terms of looking at regenerative agriculture, where you have partnerships between farmers who have been, you know, experimenting and tinkering and trying to figure out how to actually make those principles work for that area. And then crop advisors and agronomists who are kind of you know, starting to work more with people and take soil health from their back pocket and put it right front and center in terms of how they're uh, addressing farmers and dealing with things. I think that combination of, you know, people who are open-minded, willingness, and, and, and have the willingness to tinker. I mean, from what I can see, it's that, that, ex that, you know, treating the soil experimentally in terms of trying something and seeing if it works, and then if it does, building on it, and communicating with neighbors who may have already done the experiment that didn't work, so you can spare yourself that one, <laughs> yes. are important. And I really loved what, what Mark said about the, uh, the power of just looking at the soil, because there's so much to that, that I think that the, you know, the concept of soil health is a bit like the concept of human health, where it's a bit squirrely in terms of how to really define it. You know, it's like we, we tend to define our own health mostly when we lack it, when we're, we know when we're sick, we don't tend to pay a whole lot of attention to health when we're healthy. Uh, and maybe that's why we get sick, but that's a whole other issue. Exactly. And I, I think the land is kind of similar where when we have healthy fertile soils, we take them for granted or we have in the past. And we now have so much degraded land that more and more people are starting to realize that the land is sick and that we can treat it. We can take care of it and we can, we can steward it much better. And getting a feel for what that looks like and feels like, I think, is as powerful as any soil test that one can do. Thanks. Um, yeah, we do have a, a few questions here. Um, Senator Black uh, asked about the various roles of government, um, but he also had to leave for another meeting. So we're off the hook from answering that question about how... <laughs> I think I'd, I'd love to stay a little bit after uh, if we wanted to have that discussion. But, um, and, and there's a few other uh, questions. Uh, microplastics, maybe we would stay behind and ask, answer that one for you. But um, we've, got, we've got interest here, David, about like, what if it was a very small plot? Like some of, some of the listeners have just a small garden. What was, what was the secret sauce for Anne? And, or do they have to read the book? Um, in just a, in just a few uh, sentences, and then we're going to wrap up for tonight. Cool. Well, you know, I obviously encourage people to read the book because we did we did write a lot of this down. But the, you know, the basics are pretty similar in what we did in our yard to those basic principles of conservation agriculture. 
we basically applied a lot of organic matter um, and we, we didn't disturb the soil. So we didn't do any double digging or digging stuff in. We basically were patient and allowed the biology to work. And so it really comes down to reseeding and kickstarting soil biology and soil life and letting them do the work because there's trillions of them. They, you know, it's better to have them on our side than working against them. Um, and so in terms of uh, you know, our yard, it's a couple thousand square feet in the yard. We managed to sequester several tons of carbon basically just in our yard with gardening, which you know, is not gonna solve the world's climate problem, but it's a good start. And if everybody did that in the yards, you can do it on a small, you can, you can improve the soil in a window box and you can do it on a, a giant farm. The, those, those basic principles are scalable. The practices are not. So obviously you wouldn't be driving a tractor around your yard unless you got a bigger yard than I do. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the principles of minimal disturbance, keeping the ground covered and growing a diversity of things matters. So in our vegetable beds, for example, you know, we rotate through a bunch of stuff um, with, with the seasons. Um, and basically the goal of rebuilding soil organic matter, that, I mean, that's the secret sauce right there. That's simple. That's simple. And get the book. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's oh. not easy, but it's <laughs> yeah, simple. It's not that simple. I want to just ask you all uh, just a quick response to what everyone might be wondering. Like, what is, even if it's just a small thing, what is something that all the listeners um, could do to improve soil health, no matter where you are, Toronto or, or not? Um, Joanne, what do you think? Um, talk to your friends and your family about soil or about what you're doing in your gardens or where you're buying your food and make food a priority when you're in your grocery store, really look out, look for the local stuff and ask the, you know, the people working there if, where things are coming from and why, if there's a, if it's apple season, why is it still Washington apples and not Ontario apples? Sorry about the Washington chat there, but Ooh. Yeah, I don't, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, just shop local. That's the biggest thing you can do to help is um, sometimes people say it costs more, but it's totally worth it. And it doesn't always cost more, just sometimes. Um, yeah. Any final words? Sorry, was that for me? Yeah. Well, the, the same question is what would you, uh, what's something that anyone listening could do? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you don't have to be a farmer. You don't have to be uh, running um, a large scale operation to be concerned about soil health. You definitely don't have to be a large scale operation to be uh, improving soil health. I think get your hands dirty and observe and play in soil. It's, um, it's amazing. And the more time you spend doing it, you will see trends. Um, you'll say you have a little home garden and you like growing um, yourself and you pay attention, take notes, look at when, look at the soil and, and at times when your crop did really well. Uh, if your crop's not doing well, don't be afraid to get in the soil and ha have a look and see if there's something visibly different between one section in your garden to another section. Keep those notes and, and um, that's gold for, for future, future learning. And you can no, always turn really, back on it. Yeah, no, it really is, uh, you just fall in love with it, eh? Yeah. Um, I, I think we're going to stick around uh, for the rest of you if you want to have a, a few more kind of questions and answers, but we're just going to wrap it up to keep us on time. So I wanted to, um, yeah, thank all of our speakers uh, for your thoughts and contributions. And thanks also to all of you that are listening, even if this is just the recording. Um, and thank you for caring about soil, because uh, even if we are just doing little small things here and there, like it really adds up to make a big difference. And I am really optimistic and I hope that you got that sense. Um, so the webinar uh, will be posted on the Green Belts uh, Foundation's website. And you can also find the Power of Soil report. Uh, Megan, if you're able to pop it in the chat, that'd be great. So the Power of Soil report is um, yeah, on the website if you want to learn more. And, and also, I, I think that is important. Like we're gonna have to deal at the policy level. I, would, I wish that Senator Black was still here to have this conversation because we do need to involve the government and wherever you are, talk to your MP, talk to your MPP. This matters even if you're downtown Toronto and, uh, and we can all make a difference by getting loud. So thank you everyone. I'll, um, we'll, we'll stop the recording or stop the webinar now, but if you'd like to stay, uh, we can have a, a bit more conversation offline.
Okay, I think that's enough long enough pause to chop it. Uh, Paul Smith, um, bravo, thank you.